you now is take a well-deserved five-minute break. We'll set the timer. Please come back. If board members can please come back to the table and discontinue your conversations, or if you want to continue having a conversation, please take it outside. Thank you very much. All right, welcome back board members. And before we depart item number five on the agenda, I think we have some additional business that some of the board members would like to advance for consideration. So I'm going to look for motions um, from any of the board members, Mike Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to make a motion concerning an emergency action. I believe you have the language. And there it is. Um, so move that the Stripe Bass Board by emergency action as outlined in the Commission's ISFMP charter implement a 31 inch maximum size to all existing recreational fishery regulations where a higher, excuse me, <coughs> or no maximum size applies excluding the Chesapeake Bay trophy fisheries. All other recreational size limits, possession limits, seasons, gear restrictions, and spawning protections remain in place. Jurisdictions are required to implement compliant measures as soon as possible and no later than July 2nd, 2023. Thank you, Mike. We have second, David Borden. And Mike, would you like to speak to this motion? I sure would. Um, so I guess the challenge here is convincing you that this is an emergency. We have a backstop. We have an addendum going. Um, <clears throat> the problem is we have an entire year of fishing on a very, very strong year class. Um, emergency measures haven't been used much, maybe half a dozen times or so. Um, and the definition is circumstances under which conservation of a coastal fishery resource or attainment of fishery management objectives, that's the key, has been placed substantially at risk by unanticipated changes in the ecosystem, the stock, or the fishery. So let me address the unanticipated first. We doubled harvest, almost. I, I went back in the time series for Emmerich all the way back to 81. And that has only happened a couple of times, the last time being almost 30 years ago. So although I think we all sat around saying, this is a big year class, you know, harvest will go up. We could not have anticipated that it was gonna go up by double. It just, it's never had that. Now, that being said, I have faith that Emre is right. We do 6,000 intercepts a year in Massachusetts, about 5,000 are, for striped bass. That's a lot of data that you can complain about MRIP for other species. I think they got it right, especially on a coastal uh, without breaking it up into modes and, and waves and everything else. Um, so what we saw was the 22 harvest completely de derailed the rebuilding to down to a 11 or 15% chance of getting there. I would, I, I told you a little about what we looked at our rec fishery and really great graphics of the 2015 was about 55% into the slot and we doubled the harvest. There's no question in my mind that <clears throat> there is 0% chance of the harvest going down. I mean, the PSEs on this estimate are fine. They're as good as they've always been. I mean, there, there's always unbiased uh, biased things that can change, but I, I have faith that the harvest this year will be the same, or I would say greater, because the entire year class is in the slot. Um, what really worries me is the, the further we get behind the eight ball, the more draconian the rules become. In 2026, SSB is going to start including the weakest year classes we've seen in 40 years. We have never seen four or five year classes as weak as they are since the 1980s in the middle of a stock collapse. So we're going to have to deal with that. And it's going to get more and more difficult if harvest is huge again this year. 
um, let's see. And I guess, and actually, it was interesting. Mike Abdow on on the uh, webinar brought up the fact that he thinks effort is increasing. We had anglers say last year was the best fishing they've ever had, and a lot of it was in environmental conditions and and presence of menhaden, but also the presence of a, a really big year class. So I, I mean, there's just no question that they're more available this year. How could harvest go down? And there's also, I think we've all seen this, uh, I'd call it irrational exuberance by the fishing community. When fishing gets good, um, fishing effort goes up and probably not in a linear fashion. So people coming off a great year, I'm, I'm guessing that effort will go up much more. We'll get the casual anglers will be going out more. Um, we have no output controls and that makes it very difficult managing this wrecked fishery. So I propose this because I don't want to be further behind the eight ball. I don't want to see another projection again that includes 11% probability of, of restoration. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike. David, as seconder, would you like to comment? Yeah, just briefly, um, Mike pretty much hit all up. All the points that I would I would make. One of one of my biggest concerns here is this uh, issue that if we don't take action, we end up in a situation where we have to take much more draconian action in the in the future. And frankly, I don't want to be in that position. So I'd rather have a discussion about about this type of activity. The, the other point I would make in a kind of response to some of the issues that have come up is I think the state state uh, agencies at this point are really doing an outstanding job of of going out to the recreational leadership uh, on these issues i um, in almost every agency that i know of has outreach programs and so i'm although i'm concerned about the public circumventing the public process i i think we've got to weigh that against the necessity to protect the resource this is one of our premier species and we've got to take action and failure to take action should not be an option thank you thank you david before i turn to the board for discussion i'd like to go to bob to get to, just to make sure everybody's on the same page clarity with um, the emergency action definition and the isfmp charter so bob Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yet, you know, the good news is it's been quite a while since the commission's taken an emergency action. Um, so, uh, but, but which probably means folks aren't real familiar with the process anymore. Um, but just not speaking obviously in favor or in opposition to this, just process wise, what it means to do an emergency is uh, it takes a two thirds vote of all voting members of the board. There's 16 members here today, so it would take 11 votes in favor to pass this motion. There are some strange provisions if the federal, either of the federal agencies um, abstain, and that would change the math a little bit. We can get to that should that occur. Um, and the way it works is the uh, an emergency would be uh, in effect for up to 180 days. So if this motion were to pass, it would be in effect for 180 days beginning today. Um, and it would be, uh, which I think carries you to October 28th or 29th, something along those lines. Um, and if the board uh, wants to extend this, uh, there can be two extensions of an emergency um, up to one year each. So ultimately, a, an emergency can be in effect for two and a half years if that's what the board chose to do. Um, the one stipulation is that the board needs to initiate an addendum uh, to, to implement similar changes, which the board has already done. So if the board got to October and wanted to extend this into early next year to allow the addendum that's being, that was um, discussed in the previous motion, just to, you know, if they wanted to extend this for a certain period of time to extend it until that addendum takes effect, they would have that flexibility um, at the annual meeting. And that would just take a simple majority. Extensions of emergencies don't take the two thirds provision. So I think those are the basic process pieces of, a, of an emergency. Um, happy to answer any questions. You know, there are some provisions on what constitutes an emergency. Um, some of it uh, relates back to unexpected changes and unexpected events occurring. Um, and, um, and those unexpected events or changes um, 
in this instance, I think it is, um, you know, impacted the achievement of the fishery management plan goals. And, and one of the major goals here, obviously, is to rebuild the stock. So, you know, there probably is some discussion that may happen, whether this is or isn't justified as an emergency. I think Mike commented a lot on that in, in his uh, opening statements about the uh, motion. So happy to answer any questions, but those just so everybody's on kind of the same page process wise. That's what, uh, you know, just wanted to, to make sure everybody knew the basics. Thank you, Bob. Is there any questions specifically on process for Bob just before we get into discussion? Any questions for Jeff? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a question to Bob. I think the term you used that the, the board would need to initiate an addendum that uh, investigates similar measures to the emergency action. Um, does the, the addendum that we just uh, voted for, is that similar enough? Does it give us the opportunity to explore other options besides this one that is on the table in front of us? Yeah, the, the action that was talked about in the previous motion is is in line with what's needed to extend this. Um, you know, really, this motion is potentially dealing with, you know, what we learned today about the projections and, and rebuilding by 2029. And so is that so is that addendum. So those two are consistent and, and sort of tackling the same problem. Sorry, Emily. And just one other thing to add for process, if this emergency action were to pass today, the other requirement is within 30 days of taking emergency action. So this month, the commission would have to hold at least four public hearings. So this would be to gather some initial public input um, on this action. So just FYI. So thank you, Emily. Um, last call for questions on process. Just want to make sure we get that clear. Everybody's good on that. Okay, we will open it up for discussion. And Steve, I saw your name. I saw your hand up there early, so we're going to start with Steve. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to speak in favor of this, and it's kind of reluctantly. I think emergency action is something we really shouldn't do. It seems like we only do something like this if we have failed. We haven't done our job, and we need to correct it. Uh, the environment has changed, the ecosystem has changed, and we, we haven't got the ability to correct that, so we need to work on what we have. Or we've had an increase in effort uh, that we couldn't foresee and can't control. And I think I think that's where our problem is. And uh, it seems like, I, I said this once before, and I hate repeating myself, everybody wants us to do something so they can keep fishing, but they don't want it to affect them, and it has to. And so this is something I see that is going to at least attempt to rectify the problem we're in. Thank you, Steve. Mike, did I, I had you right? Okay, go ahead, Mike. You tell me if you have me on your list. I, yeah, I had my hand up. Um, yeah, thanks, Marty. So when uh, Dr. Armstrong and I spoke a couple weeks ago um, regarding this action, my my initial gut reaction was this is this sounds crazy this you know an emergency action really based on an MRIP preliminary data point um, that's you know affecting our projections for you know years from now <clears throat> however in discussions with other board members and and with Mike as well uh, I and, and colleagues within within Maryland um, I certainly understand the desire of the public uh, and the need for this, given the information that was presented in the technical committee report and the understanding that this 2015 year class will be fully recruited into the fishery this year. If we wait another year, we are likely to be looking down the barrel at something much worse uh, than if we take swift, swift action at this time. It, um, I did question originally whether or not this fit the criteria within the commission's charter on what an emergency action is but i think in um you know what bob said earlier and some of the points that uh were just made uh, i can agree that you know we've met the criteria for an emergency action the one thing so what i'm saying i do support this action at this time I do have one question though for the maker, uh, and this was something that we have discussed, but I would like to hear it either from staff 
uh, or Bob or Tony um, regarding the points here. So, uh, Mike, you state here that all other recreational size limits, possession limits, seasons, gear restrictions, and so forth will remain in place. I assume that that you could bracket that and um, consider that states that are using conservation equivalency currently is not affected by these changes because in Amendment 7, when modifications to the limits are made within a state, I believe there was some language in there that spoke to that, you know, you no longer have the ability when the stock is not, is still overfished to use conservation equivalency. And I'd like to clarify that for the record uh, in moving forward. First, your intent. And then secondly, if we can get something from staff, um, you know, regarding conservation equivalency, that would be helpful since we have implemented conservation equivalency plans in the Bay. Okay. Um, the, the intent would be yes, not to mess with the CEs now. This is just an overlay. It, it's an emergency action, doesn't change the FMP, and I believe that's how it works. And I'll let these folks comment about that. So, yes, so to clarify, this emergency action outlines what the measures would be for the next 180 days and if it were extended or so basically this sets the measures until this emergency action expires or until the board takes a new action, for example, the addendum. So how this reads is this would simply implement the 31 inch maximum size on top of what is currently implemented as of January 1st, 2023. So the new measures are essentially 2023 measures with 31. So, right, so the new measures are just what is currently implemented in 2023 with this 31 max overlay. So that doesn't impact seasons, doesn't impact bag limits, anything like that. And that is in place until this expires or a new action is taken. So hopefully that helps clarify. Mike, are you all set on that answer? All good. Okay. So we have a few people in queue. So we're going to go next to um, Dr. Davis, and then we're going to go to Emerson, Jason McNamee, and Tom Foti. Go ahead, Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to move to amend this motion, and I think staff has some language uh, for that. So I'll wait to see if we can get that up on the board. So this is a motion to amend. Move to amend to add measures for the four higher sector will remain status quo in the event the board extends the emergency action past the initial 180 day effective period the four higher sector exemption from emergency measures cannot be extended second by eric reed all right back to you dr davis you can go ahead and comment to your motion thank you mr chairman so i'll start out by saying i support the underlying motion um i think it's a good precautionary action by the board to to take action this year to reduce removals based on what you know we now know happened in 2022 from my standpoint what was unanticipated you know when we met in November there was discussion we knew that removals in in 2022 were likely going to be high um, I had been hearing from constituents how good the fishing was we knew that that 2015 year class had aged into the slot what was unanticipated from my perspective was the the impact on the rebuilding probabilities that they were going to drop that dramatically from what we got out of the 2022 stock assessment. So I can support the emergency action, but I do think we have to acknowledge that it's a substantial departure from our normal management process. We are going to take a vote today potentially to change regulations without having noticed that to the public, without any public input process uh, in an unexpected manner. And I, I don't think we should take that lightly. And I think where that dynamic is most pronounced is with the four higher sector. Um, I think we do have an obligation to the four higher sector to provide them timely notification of what the regulations are going to be in a given year so they can plan their businesses and, and book business accordingly. So 
what this motion would do is essentially hold the four higher sector status quo for this initial 180 day effective period of the emergency action, but then not provide any opportunity for an extension of that exemption. So I've heard, you know, one of the concerns about this is this is opening the door to a mode split on striped bass, and that is not my intent at all. I would not support any options for 2024 with a mode split for striped bass. I wouldn't support any options for a mode split while this stock is in rebuilding. So I just want to be really clear about that, especially to any members of the Connecticut for higher sector who might be listening in today, uh, I'm not willing to contemplate that past this emergency measure. But I do think uh, this is in keeping with our obligation to the for higher sector to give them you know, timely and accurate notification of rules for the coming year. I stood up at public meetings in Connecticut in February and March and told the four higher sector that straight bass would be status quo this year. And it really bothers me to at the 11th hour when the season has already started, when these guys have booked all their business to come back and say, actually, guess what? We're using this emergency provision that most people didn't really know existed to change the rules unilaterally without any input and any public notice. That really bothers me. So I'm, I'm hoping that members of the board can see their way to support this. Thanks. Thank you, Justin. Eric, would you like to comment as seconder? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I agree with Dr. Davis's rationale, and I also want to point out that uh, the for hire sector is a, is a minimal participant in this fishery, relatively speaking, and they do provide uh, data through their EVTRs, which I don't want to. I don't want to miss that point as well. We talk a lot about whether MRIP is good, bad, or indifferent, but the VTR data we get from the four hire fleet is accurate, and I think that's a, a component we should not lose. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. We we had two in the queue. If you want to maintain your spot, so it would be um, Jason McNamee and then Tom Fody. Jason, you want to speak? So, oh, Emerson. Jay, if you could be so kind, I got a number next to Emerson to precede yours. So it'd be Emerson, Jason, and then Tom Fody. Thank you. Sorry, Emerson. Test. Oh, there we go. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry to just butt in like that. Um, my hand was up um, to make a uh, similar motion to amend, but Dr. Davis beat me to it here. Um, but my motion to amend was going to um, uh, continue the exemption for the four higher sector to the end of 2023 um, based on uh, Bob Beal's um, uh, determination or, or, or clarification earlier that this emergency action would end at the end of October. And I, I don't think um, it's going to, I think it's going to be very um, dis, disadvantageous to the four higher fleet to be able to uh, fish on the current slot limit through the end of October and then um, change to a different slot limit for November and December. And in New York, we have a robust fishery um, in November through um, through the through the close of the season, mid December. So, and I know at the beginning of this, Mr. Chairman, you said you didn't want to go two motions deep. <laughs> um, so I don't know if the maker and the seconder uh, would consider a friendly to extend this through the end of the year. Um, if they don't, then I'm going to look to make a, a motion to amend. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So completely understand the concerns that Emerson has raised. Unfortunately, the way I see it is that we're voting up an emergency action. That emergency action can only last 180 days unless the board takes subsequent action to extend it. So really, we can only make a decision right now of what's going to happen for the next 180 days. I understand that what we're gonna end up doing is potentially ending up in a situation where we're gonna to get to late October and the rules would change for the four higher sector. But personally, I'm not willing to open up the possibility of another extension past 180 days for this mode split, because again, I'm looking to be 
really conservative here with this to only provide this exemption for the 180 days and provide no potential opportunity for it to be extended. Um, so that's why I have that clause in here. And I, I think because of that, now, you know, with this motion, we can't really contemplate extending it past the 180 days. And I'm not willing to open the door to that whatsoever. And I also think by late October, the majority of the fishing year is over. Certainly there are some jurisdictions that are still fishing into November. You know, it's it's unfortunate, but I think the four higher sector would probably prefer to have the exemption for 180 days and have to deal with that in late October versus not having the exemption at all. So I I would not be open to that amendment to this motion. Thank you, Justin. Um, Eric is a seconder. Did you just want to add a comment to that? Yeah, I do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So my my question is is about the process. Um, if the emergency action goes in place by July second, is it 180 days from July second, or is it 180 days from today? All right, now it's on. I think is it on? All right. So the speakers are having, or the microphone system's having a little quirk where only one can be on at a time and you've got to restart every time. So um, be patient, we'll try to get it fixed. Um, Eric, to answer your question, and the, the clock starts today on 180 days. So whenever whenever the board passes the emergency, that's when the clock starts. Um, and then also while I'm speaking, if you don't mind, Mr. Chair, all these motions to amend or, or changes to the main motion, like a simple majority to approve those, they don't take the two thirds vote. It's once you get, the final emergency motion perfected and the group's gonna vote on that. That's when the two thirds vote comes in. Okay, we're back to the original queue. So I have Jason and then Tom Fody and Bill Hyatt next. Thanks Mr. Chair. Actually, <clears throat> I don't have anything to add for the, the current uh, amendment. Um, if you could keep me in the queue when we get back to the main motion, I'd appreciate that, but nothing to add here. All right, Tom. Yeah, I want to keep in the queue for the main motion, but I want to talk about this motion also. New Jersey passed a law this year that was finally implemented this year on environmental justice. And when I look at this regulation, we have a lot of shore-based anglers that basically, that's, you know, I look at one of the reasons we're up in this mess was, if you remember when we first started doing overfishing, because MREPs said they got a better feel for the shore-based angler, and that's when we were pushed over fishing. And that, so it's in the shore-based angler. So you're basically telling the people that can't afford to go on party and charter boats, that basically you know want to just go to the beach and throw in a rod and, and basically have that. You put them out of the fishery most of the time because a lot of the areas you don't see fishing larger than 18 inches or 22 inches or 24 inches in you know city along the Hudson River and in those areas most of the year. And so you shut those people out, or, and I've been complaining about this for years, so it ain't the first time I brought it up, but now you're in really fuel to the fire, that we're basically telling them, you're just screwed and we're gonna leave you screwed. And now we're gonna about let the party in charge vote. And I understand, and I'm, I'll talk to you the original motion that I'm not gonna support the original motion, but this is even worse, more complicated than that. You basically affect all the shore-based anglers in New Jersey and those that can't afford. So you basically shut them out of a fishery. Now you force them to do all catch and release because they'll sit in there and catch fish all day. Most of the time when the shore base angler catches a fish, he kind of takes it off because he has to get in a nice one to get it cleaned and everything else not sit in the cooler all day long. But they'll now stay on the beach because you basically have to get that little fish in that, that little slot you're going to put in place. So I mean, it's I find that the catch and release mortality is going to go through the roof. The, uh, the only people who are going to be happy about this regulation is the catch and release fish, because then they can do away with all the competition of anybody out there in a party and charter boat. So you're going to basically see the private boats not go out fishing. So it's going to affect the, the uh, marinas, gas stocks, and everything else. You're also going to see tackle stores affected when you do this on a shore base angle, because the guy's going to not going to travel Pennsylvania into New Jersey like they do all the time in Ohio. To be able to catch a fish with a three inch four inch slot limit. 
an emergency action. So I will get back to the original motion when you come in, but this is, you can't do it separately. You can't really, you got to do it all. Matter of fact, what I would suggest, because I have a long history and long memory, that when we had the moratorium in place, that most states had a moratorium. There was only two states that didn't have a moratorium, was New Jersey and interestingly, Massachusetts. And while we had the moratorium in New York, Maryland, Virginia, they were still shipping 100,000 pounds to, to market because they were hook and line fishery. But they had to follow the regulations as we basically put the same in. So the slight, same slot limit, or actually was back then was maximum size limit, basically did it for the commercial fishery as well. So we should be talking about, if you're gonna do this, the hook and line commercial fishery, which is different than the net fishery, should have the same rec regulation also because they can stay in the side, do hook and release the same way we can do. So Massachusetts should implement this in their hook and line commercial fishery, but I bet, because it doesn't affect them, they'll vote for this. And Maryland, because it's all under conservation equivalency, will also vote for this. So at this time, I'll leave it at that with another bite at the apple when we pass, we'll vote down this motion. All right, thanks, Tom. So chair's starting to feel a little squeeze on the time management with luncheon coming up. So I'm gonna ask everybody to kind of be concise as they can be. So I've got Bill Hyatt, followed by Megan Ware, followed by Chris Bat-Savage, followed by Mike Armstrong. I think that captures it. So go ahead, Bill. Test. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I just want to speak briefly in support of this motion to amend, maybe add a few additional thoughts along those lines. Uh, we heard early the, earlier the technical committee report, and if I'm remembering it correctly and remembering what I read correctly, uh, it doesn't matter whether you use the three-year average of F or, or the F for 2022 that resulted in the, in the exceptionally high harvest. It doesn't matter either way. The population, if we do nothing, will level off somewhere north of 50% between the threshold and the target. So what that tells me is that the crisis that we're dealing with today relative to these emergency regulations is more of a, a crisis of process than a crisis of conservation. Um, and, and looking at it in that light, it, it seems to me unreasonable to go out to a, a group of individuals who in good faith have book business for a, a, a period of time, the, the first two thirds of the 2023 fishing season, it seems unreasonable to encumber them, um, given that this is, again, more of a crisis of process than of conservation, it seems unreasonable to encumber them when they're such a small component of the, of the fishery. So I would strongly speak in favor of this motion to amend. With regard to the dis discussion that we've had about extending it beyond that, I, I, I just think it's unnecessary because by the time you get to October, the industry will have, have had enough of a heads up and be on, back on a level playing field with everybody else in the recreational sector. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. So we're going to have Megan, Chris, and Mike Armstrong, and then we're going to go to the Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, while I'm very supportive of the underlying emergency action, I'm going to oppose the motion, the motion to amend. Uh, I'm pretty uncomfortable with instituting a mode split, even if it's for 180 days uh, within the striped bass fishery at this point. Uh, that is a very contentious topic uh, that this commission has not grappled with in any formal way. Uh, and so to do it via emergency action, I think it's just adding fuel to the fire. And it's a discussion that warrants a much more thorough uh, public comment and, and discussion by this board that's not afforded in an emergency action. Um, I'm also a little concerned that in Amendment 7, some of the decisions that the board made focused on more consistent measures, especially when the stock is overfished. And I think instituting a, a mode split at this time would be counter to some of the intent that was in Amendment 7 for more consistent measures, particularly in the rec sector, when the stock is overfished. Um, and I'll point that the underlying motion right now has action happening both in the ocean and the Chesapeake Bay recreational fisheries. Um, so kind of in the spirit of preserving that equity that everyone's participating in this, I cannot support carving out uh, exemption for one portion of the rec sector at this point. So thank you. Thanks, Megan. We'll go to Chris Bat-Savage. 
Hey, it works. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I am also speaking in opposition to the uh, amend amendment, a motion to amend. Um, I mean, we you know, support mode splits in, in other uh, fisheries, uh, recreational fisheries, uh, and um, can sympathize with the justification given for um, the exemption for the for a higher fishery for this uh, 180 day period. But uh, uh, I think Mike Armstrong really um, laid out the uh, the reasons why we're taking an emergency action. And uh, uh, I think the, the more we can do in that action and not have exemptions, uh, the better off we're going to be until we put something more permanent in place to an addendum. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Um, Mike, you have the last um, you have the last say, and then we're going to go to the public and call the question. Thank you. Um, I don't support this, and because I don't think there'll be a really negative effect on the for hire fleet. This isn't a bag limit. This isn't a season. So I don't see people canceling. I'm trying to wrap my head around people who pay for a fishing trip being told you have to take a 30 inch fish instead of 33 inch fish and they go, oh, that's it, I'm canceling. Um, it, yeah, it, so I don't see it being a big impact. This is a big year class all the way from 28 to 35 and any charter captain worth his salt can get you a 31, 30 inch fish if you can't get a 34 inch fish. And so I a negative impact on the charter fleet. Thank you, Mike. All right, so what I'd like to do now is go to staff and see if we could set up a one and one So in the interest of time, because we're we're starting to run short, <clears throat> although we'll take what we, time we need, but we want to be sensitive to the luncheon that's coming up, um, take one comment for and one against this amendment. So I'd look to the room first, see if anybody is in favor of this amendment in, this, in the room. Not seeing any. Is anybody online that would like to raise their hand that's in favor of this amendment? Okay. All right. Taylor Vavra, go ahead and unmute. One minute, please, Taylor. We cannot hear you. Try again. Can you try again? I'm sorry, Taylor, but we still cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? It's a little bit better. Try again. Can you hear me now? Hello? We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, cool. I, uh, Mr. Luisi just really summed up. My Taylor Vavra representing Stripers Forever um, just basically summed up exactly what I was going to say, which is that um, we certainly support this emergency action and, and um, the, the original amendment. Um, this amendment, though, we would not support. You know, this should be an equitable uh, thing that should apply to all parties involved. Um, and so uh, it just doesn't make any sense. I don't, as Mr. Lisi stated, I don't think it would affect any charters. Um, you know, this is not saying you cannot harvest fish. It's just reducing um you know the size of what you can take um and i think that's only fair uh to all parties involved um in the recreational sector so uh that would be it thank you taylor could you clarify you're in favor of the amendment is it wasn't clear to me we're, well we're, we're no i'm sorry uh, we're in favor of the emergency action not in favor of this amendment to that Okay, so we'll, thank you, Taylor. We'll go for a second person in favor of these of this amendment, and look looking online if there's anyone who is in favor. Robert DeCosta, if you could unmute your microphone and one minute, Robert. I thank you. Um, I like to speak in favor of this amendment for the main reason that this whole. This whole issue is being based on MREP data, which we, we in the in the uh, 
for hire sector have a we don't have a lot of faith in the MREC data, but yet all of us who fish in the for hire sector do e-trip reports and we give you detailed catches of what we catch, what we release every day. And this this would allow you to really track what the percentage of fish that are caught and the percentage of fish that are released by going through the e-tip the e-ticket e uh, data versus just dockside interviews and the internet data. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I do want to note we had two other folks that raised their hands that are in favor of this amendment that were online. So in the interest of time, we won't be able to take those, but we're going to shift to those who are against the amendment. I'm looking in the room and Mike Wayne, you'd like to come up to the public speaker. Just on the motion to amend, correct? So I'm gonna speak in opposition of this. Um, you know, if we're gonna rebuild striped bass, we're not gonna be able to hand out conservation passes. And all I see that this motion does is it gives a conservation pass to the for hire industry. And you know, the for hire is a huge part of the sport fishing industry. They introduce a lot of anglers to our sport. And so I feel the conservation ethics should start with them. We shouldn't be giving them a pass. And the same comments that Justin made about businesses needing to plan, that applies to all the tackle shops. They had some of the best fishing in business that they had last year. And so they're planning on that picking up again. And if we're gonna carve out for the four hires, then what, what about the tackle businesses? What, what do we tell them? They're not worthy of a carve out? And this is what I mean, it just spirals from there. So if we're gonna rebuild this, everyone's gonna participate. Anybody that fishes for striped bass contributes to F, and uh, we're gonna need everyone to play a role in that, thanks. All right, thanks, Mike. We'll look for one last um, person to weigh in on public comment against the amendment. Are we at two? Okay, so we have two against it. All right, so uh, we're ready to call, call the question. And you need a two-minute two caucus. Um, Roy, do you have clar need clarification? Uh, Marty, I would just like to point out before we vote that um, based on my many, many years of experience, uh, in striped bass management with, with the commission. I believe this is the first time we're contemplating sector-specific um, measures. And I just want to point that out for everybody that it's kind of unprecedented and makes me a little uncomfortable. Thank you. All right, thank you, Roy. Let's go for a one-minute caucus and we'll call a question. Okay. Get everybody's attention, we'll go ahead and call the question. All those in favor of the amended motion, please raise your hand. We have a request for a roll call. Oh, it automatically have. so it's gonna happen anyway, Emerson. So we'll go ahead and everybody go ahead and if you're in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Tony is going to read those off. Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey. All those opposed to the motion, please raise their hands. Massachusetts, Potomac River Fisheries Commission, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Virginia, District of Columbia, Maryland, Delaware, Maine, and New Hampshire. Are there any null votes? Are there any abstentions? National Marine Fisheries Service and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Motion fails. What is it? Four, four to ten to two. The motion fails. Four ten to. We're back to the main motion.
All right, I'll look for any additional board discussion on the main motion. Mike Luisi. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, given the comments that were made, I believe it was by Emerson earlier about the timing, the 180 day timing on this, I think we should have some clarification as a board if this were to be supported how the timing plays into states implementing these measures um, so that we don't have to go through so let's say 180 days expires and we want to re we want to reinitiate another 180 days do we have to go through all of the same process that we did the first time or is that a simple just looking for some clarification so that states can at least start to plan for if this passes how we're going to deal with the end of October into November and carrying out through the rest of the year. It would be our intent, as well as some of our other my other colleagues here sitting close to me, that we would prefer to put this in place and leave it in place for the remainder of the year until addendum addendum two would be worked on uh, for implementation of new measures in 2024, if that ends up being the case. So any clarification will be helpful. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Mike. I'll look to Bob. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. The only authority the board has today under emergency action is to implement a 180 day provision. It, the, we can't extend anything beyond that through emergency. So if the board wanted to extend this beyond that, um, they could do that, at, say, the annual meeting. Um, and it could be through a simple majority. It could just be a, a simple motion that says, you know, we move to extend the uh, emergency action that was approved on May 2nd. And and that can be, that extension can be up through to one, um, 365 days. So simple board action doesn't take anything be that. Does that help, Mike? Yes. Pack here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to add on to what Mike was saying, um, Primarily in Virginia, our season is October through December, so this will be right in the middle of our season. Probably what we would end up doing is, as Mike said, and changing our course for the entire year and, and keeping that way. It, just, it would be too chaotic for our fishermen to basically have the season start at one size limit and change it mid, midstream. So um, the other question I had was about uh, adopting those measures. Um, we can, we're, we're willing to do it. We may not be have, have it completed by July 2nd, but we can certainly have it completed before our season opens in October. Would that be a problem? If we're in the pro, we would be in the regulatory process, but because of a new regulatory um, procedure that we've gone through, we, we get some delays and we've got a lot of other things on our plate right now, but we will definitely have it in place before our season starts in October. Okay, thanks, Pat. Um, so we've got three other folks. Um, we have Jeff Brust, Ray Kane, and then Tom. We'll give you one more. Please be as concise as you can. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just I wanted to speak uh, in opposition of this motion. I think, um, you know, in, notwithstanding the red flags that we're seeing from the 2022 harvest, I'm a little concerned that we don't know what this proposed measure is going to do, what savings it will have. Uh, I do not have the, the um, benefit of sitting next to Gary Nelson to, to look at those numbers. I would like to be able to have the technical committee review these and vet these. I believe that the amendment that we've, that, uh, that we've proposed that we've taken action on uh, for 2024 will give the TC the opportunity to look at these, uh, this option and several others. Um, I do think there are possibly some other factors that are affected as, as we've discussed around the table this morning. Uh, so I do want to speak in opposition. I also do want to uh, clarify perhaps from staff um, for the maker of the motion, this, this motion uh, affects recreational fisheries. New Jersey's commercial fishery has been allocated to the recreational fishery, our bonus program. I just wanted to clarify, is that a commercial quota or is that covered under this motion as well? Thank you. So 
I think that would perhaps go back to the maker of the motion as to his intent of whether or not this would cover the New Jersey bonus fishery. Um, I guess as written, this would implement a 31 inch maximum size. And I know the bonus fishery right now is 24 to 28. So in effect, I guess if you if you change the bonus size limits, the question is, would it apply? So I would go back to the maker of the motion there. Um, and just while I have the floor, I just want to, again, clarify that this 31 inch maximum size applies to all states, no matter if you did CE or if you didn't do CE, this 31 inch maximum would apply to your size limit. Um, every, again, everything else, seasons, possession limits, et cetera, would stay the same, but this 30 applies to all states no matter if you did CE or not. So I will go back to the maker of the motion as to whether or not he intended this to apply as well to the bonus fishery in New Jersey. Uh, no, it was not our intent. I believe the bonus fishery is, sorry, what's the size? I just lost it. Uh, 28 inches so that is out of the slot and pretty much out of the 2015 so it was not our intent to change the uh, bonus fishery jeff does that answer your question it does thank you okay we've got ray kane tom Fody, and we're going to go to the public thank you mr chairman uh, this would go to process bob we just heard from Virginia. Could we come back at the August meeting, the summer meeting, and this could be brought up again by Virginia or Maryland after they've had a chance to talk to their recreational industry between now and then and re 180 day closure as a question of process? The short answer is yes, Ray. And you know, at the August meeting, I think this board will be better informed on the progress for the addendum because uh, I, I, the, the schedule for that really wasn't talked about, but I assume that the idea is plan development team develop something between now and the August meeting. Um, Emily has a family obligation somewhere in the middle of that time period that we're going to have to work around. But um, the uh, and then, you know, final action on that addendum at the annual meeting. So the the extension of this emergency rule at the August meeting and that extension can be up to 365 days and the the clock on that extension would not start until the end of this 180 day period if that makes sense thank you Bob thanks Ray Tom you have the last word before we go go to the public if you could make it brief it will be brief um from what I last heard that means Maryland and Virginia and the Potomac River will have to change their regulations, except for the trophy tag program, down to a 31 inch max maximum re recreationally. I, that, I just want to make sure that I'm clear on that. And the other thing I said again is that I do not support this because it, you basically have left the public out of the process. They had no idea that this was going to be on the agenda for this meeting. New Jersey did not. I didn't find out about it till. Thursday or Friday, I think it was Friday. Yeah, Friday we had a meeting and it was put in front of me. So I was completely in the dark. So I, I really cannot support this motion at this time. Maybe if we're going to do this, we do it in August, which would actually cover the November in the fishery. And if you're really worried and we, we see where we are with amendment, the new amendment to the plan. I'll leave it at that, Mark, Marty, because I know. Thanks, Tom. And yes, to your question, this 31 inch maximum would indeed apply to Chesapeake Bay recreational fisheries, except for the trophy fishery. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Emily. And we do have one board member that's online, um, Adam Nowalski. Um, so sorry, Adam, I didn't mean to cut you off. Make sure you get a chance to comment on this. Go ahead, Adam. Hearing all the comments with regards to concerns about at the end of the year, hearing comments about the implications for not making this decision with no public comment, little advance notice, no knowledge of the technical implications, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm inclined to move to postpone this until the summer meeting. Uh, 
So, Adam, you are making a motion to postpone. Yes. I'm certain until the summer meeting. And with the intent, if I got a second, it would be to do the things that I described uh, before making the motion. All right. Is there a second to Adam's motion? Craig Pugh. Adam, would you like to go ahead and speak to the motion a little more? Or are you satisfied with your introduction? Yeah, I, again, I think it just needs to be on the record that the information we would expect as part of this postponement uh, would be to get some technical uh, feedback from a TC about what this reduction would look like, uh, clear up some of the questions we've had with regards to how it might affect all of the states and their regulatory processes. Can How fast can everyone actually implement this? Uh, you know, we're looking at asking states to implement this in basically 60 days. Uh, can all the states move that fast? Uh, we would be taking ourselves out of the box of having to have to potentially change measures again this year uh, and not having that open. Everybody would basically know if we implemented this later in the year that that's what it would carry through through the end of the year. Uh, and it's really, we would expect, uh, you know, those harvest numbers, again, uh, particularly along the ocean states, to increase significantly in the fall. So it would seem like if we're truly interested in conserving the resource at the time it needs conservation, uh, that would be the time frame to go ahead and do this. It would address our public concerns uh, and make sure that we've that we're making a right decision here uh, that balances our need for conservation with our commitment to stakeholders. Thank you, Adam. Craig, do you want to add anything a seconder? Yes, it, the, the warrant of the emergency action, in my mind, needs a, a little more definition uh, to exact that. Uh, I feel as though we are regulating to a super abundant uh, supply of this of this species of fish and uh, not necessarily um, look, looking at the character uh, of the species as it exists in our shores today uh, already struck home with me uh, there's a lot of other factors involved here uh, that uh, don't warrant um, an emergency crisis so to speak uh, i'm kind of wondering why at one point when we're not catching any fish, uh, the, the ground is trembling. And then suddenly we are catching a lot of fish and the sky is falling. It seems as though we're setting ourselves up for a crisis and a definition of that here does not seem to be met at this time. So my hope would be if we postpone this, that maybe that reasoning could be brought to bear. Thank you. All right, thanks, Craig. So we'll have questions or comment from the board relating only to the timing only to the timing that's involved in this motion. Representative Peek. Yeah, I, um, I'm in opposition to this, this motion. Um, you know, an emergency action is called that for a specific reason, an emergency action. As far as needing more data, it's the data that we have over how many fish, more fish than we thought we were going to catch, has driven this action. Um, my colleague here from Massachusetts, the maker of the underlying motion, brought it exactly because of what the data shows. As far as public input, I received numerous emails and comments from constituents of all of ours, not just Massachusetts fishermen, who were imploring us to take swift and immediate action to save the stock and to reach our uh, rebuilding goals. Did they specifically say take an emergency action? No, they didn't, but I think it's because this is somewhat of an arcane provision that exists. Uh, my sense from the urgency I read in those emails is that this emergency action would be applauded because it's a swifter action than the addendum action. Let's not kick the can down the road. Let's not be wringing our hands at future meetings wishing we had taken this action. There's a high threshold. It's a two-thirds vote that's going to be required. And, um, you know, the lawyer and the legislator in me will tell you there are certain things that require a two-thirds vote, like 
to change zoning provisions if you're looking at land use. And that's because a two thirds vote is required in effect when you are taking away, in the case of zoning, somebody's property rights potentially through zoning guidelines. Well, here the two thirds vote is designed exactly because you could say there are stakeholders who to use a vernacular will get a haircut as a result of this action today. But there are times when that haircut is appropriate. I think that haircut is appropriate right now. And I ask that we defeat the further motion to postpone and take up uh, with all due haste the um, motion and support the emergency action. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Peek. Any other comments or questions related to timing only? Megan. I'll just be very brief, Sam. Opposed the motion to postpone because this will basically miss Maine's striped bass fishery in 2023. Uh, I don't know if we're the only state that way, but uh, looks like maybe New Hampshire is the same way, but I think we're starting to defeat the purpose uh, if we postpone this. Thank you, Megan. Final call for any comments, comments or questions on timing. I'll call the question. All right, let's go ahead and call the question. All those in favor of the motion to postpone, please raise your hands. New Jersey, Delaware. All those in opposed to, to the, all those opposed to the to, to the motion, please raise your hand. Potomac River Fisheries Commission, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York. Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA Fisheries, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Virginia, DC, Maryland, Maine, and New Hampshire. And all, that's all the, all the votes, yeah, final tally. The motion fails two to 14. All right, so we are back to our main motion, right? Um, I'd like to, we're going to, Steve, I see you have your hand raised, but I'm going to go to the public now and then we'll come back one more, one more bite of the apple by the board. So I'd like to go ahead and go to the public. We'll, we'll do two for, two against again for the motion on the board. So I'd ask for anyone from the public who is in favor of this motion. I'll look to the room first. Anybody who has his hand raised. And we have two online, so we'll go to both of those in succession. And they are, Emily. Michael Peary, go ahead and unmute yourself. Go ahead, Michael. One minute, please. Looking at the spawning stock biomass of the 1980s, the females in pounds were less than 30 million pounds. Today, at 2022, we're well greater than that, maybe four or five times greater than that. This does not constitute an emergency. We, we shouldn't be taking any action at all right now. Um, and I think taking action against harvest is the easy way out. Um, so when we come back here in the fall, you take action against harvest, um, catch and release mortality will be more than 75% and harvest will be 25%. You are not accomplishing anything. Um, and finally, you know, there's a lot of distrust here. This was a secret meeting that came up, but more importantly, we reference EMRIC all the time. And that uh, series query has completely changed and we can no longer uh, query historical data the way we used to. We can't uh, prove or disprove. Uh, we can't find outliers. And Okay. Yeah. And that's that's probably enough. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. So that was Michael's um, comment was opposed. So we're back to we're looking for two public members in favor of the motion, and we'll we'll get one more against. So we so in favor of the motion. The next commenter is Tony Friedrich. Tony, go ahead and unmute your microphone in one minute, please. Thank you, Marty. Uh, Tony Friedrich, Policy Director for the American Saltwater Guides Association. I'd like to thank the chairman for the opportunity to comment, keep this very short. 
I'd also like to thank all the conservation mining commission commissioners who are letting science lead the way for striped bass management. Uh, I'm sure you all saw our letter in the supplemental material. Um, supplemental was 54 pages long. Our, rep, our letter represented 44 pages of that. Uh, some of the largest fishing brands, guides, businesses, uh, and private wreck anglers showed up in numbers that we've never seen uh, before to support striped bass conservation. We are 100% positive that they would support this emergency measure. Um, the letter was originally for addendum two, but the public desperately wants uh, conservation and as quickly as possible for striped bass. Uh, abundant populations of striped bass are what drive participation in the fishing economy. Um, our members and the businesses cannot afford to lose another fish, especially as one is striped bass. I thank the makers of this motion um, and the commission for considering this. Thanks, Marty. Thank you, Tony. And we have one more for Michael Tool. If you could unmute your microphone, microphone, Michael, and you have one minute. Thank you. Sorry, Michael, you should be able to unmute your line now. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Uh, Mike Tool. Uh, I'm the uh, legislative representative for the Plum Island Surf Gassers, a 500-member uh, uh, recreational fishing club in North Shore, Massachusetts. Uh, we strongly support this amendment. Uh, basically, the public has commented constantly that uh, we need to take more action to reduce the catch and to be, show stronger conservation measures. Uh, I hear people asking about public comment that we need it, but I think we've given it for years now. And it's always been more conservative than the board. So we strongly support this measure. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So we have one comment left in opposition to this motion. Uh, so the board can be informed by both sides of the equation. And that is going to be Robert DaCosta. Mr. DaCosta, you can unmute your microphone and please clarify you're in opposition to this. Motion. Yes, I am. I am in opposition. My concern is this, uh, based on the chart that you put up earlier, the 28 to 31 inch uh, size fish is going to basically, it's going to be one year class. It's going to be the 2016 year class. Um, so the entire recreational and charter boat fishery is going to be chasing one year class and the mortality rate from release fish to find that one three inch slot fish is gonna um, put an undue burden on that next year class, not to mention how many of the 2015 year class that you're trying to save are gonna be potentially killed by uh, just not being released properly. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, appreciate that. That will end our public comment input. So we're gonna come back to the board for one last round of discussion on this motion before we call the question. I'll open it up to the board members, anyone who wants to add any additional comments. We've had our fill, okay. We'll go ahead and do a two minute caucus. All right, board members, ready to call the question. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Uh, Potomac River Fisheries Commission, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA Fisheries, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Virginia, District of Columbia, Maryland, Delaware, Maine, and New Hampshire. All those opposed to the motion, please raise your hand. Okay, New Jersey, I'm sorry. New Jersey. We're close to lunch, right? Okay. Uh, any null votes? Any abstentions? Motion carries 15 to 1. So what I'd like to do next before we... Well, I'm going to turn to Bob. I think Bob wants to, we may need to take a little break here. All right, now I'll try it. 
<clears throat> I think it would be best if we broke for lunch now, came back and took up the agenda item on the transfers um, or the addendum to consider transfers. And then we'll break for about an hour and 15 minutes. Lunch was originally scheduled for an hour and a half. So the LGA luncheon will be truncated by 15 minutes just because we're running short on time. And we do have a hard stop this evening for the awards banquet. So we don't we can't go too late with our other meetings that have to happen this afternoon. Um, so we'll come back and try to, to move through the rest of this agenda. Then we'll go ACCSP and Coastal Shark. So anybody participating in the LGA's luncheon, it's in the crystal room number three, which is back that way. And please let the LGA folks grab their lunch first so they can uh, head down to that meeting and then the rest of everybody else can hop in line and grab lunch. Thanks, Bob. So we're back here at 115, 125. 125, everyone, mark your, mark your watches. I'm out of line, can you hear me? All right, members of the Stripe Bass Board, if you could take your seats, appreciate it. We would like to reconvene this meeting of the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission Stripe Bass Management Board. We'll be going into item number six on the agenda. Before we do that, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to Emily for some clarification following the emergency action. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, to clarify for the emergency action, uh, we are required to hold four public hearings within the next 30 days. And the intent of those public hearings is to uh, help inform the development of the um, associated action, which is this upcoming addendum. So it is our intent as commission staff to hold four virtual hearings um, during this month of May, likely toward the second half of the month. And we will announce those uh, virtual public hearings via press release at least one week before the first hearing. Um, and we may reach out to board members to get some volunteers to be hearing officers, but I will keep you all posted on that. So are there any questions on that as a process item? Yep, yeah, John. Just, uh, oh, thanks, Emily. I take it these four will be open to everybody, so there won't be like state specific at all. Good question. Yes, exactly. The the hearings will be open to everyone, and we will, um, you know, be asking each commenter to provide, you know, where what state they're from and which sector they're a part of, so we can try to um, categorize the comments as best best we can, both to give to the plan development team and also to bring back to the board in August. Mike. Yeah. Thank you. Um, because we don't do this often. I'm wondering if it would be okay, well, you tell me whether or not, do we need to wait for the public hearings before we implement measures? I know it said as soon as possible, but would it would it be best to wait or should we start to work towards that now? You do not need to wait. And the, the charter identifies the, well, sort of, uh, the purpose of the hearings is to inform the public that the action took place. So, it's not getting comments, you've already taken the action, so you can go ahead and move forward. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. And Adam Nawalski, you have, you're on the webinar, you have a question? Can a state request an in-person hearing if they feel it best meets the needs of their constituents? Um, we can, Adam, uh, or a state can request it. We are just trying to keep workload as light as possible. Um, we'll be losing Emily uh, in July, and so it'll be tight for uh, commission staff, and we want to try to get as much done on that addendum before she leaves. So. And at what point would you need to know then how soon, like, do you need to know before we leave today, before we leave this week? Uh, what, what would you need time frame wise? Thanks, Adam. Yeah, I, I think if you had a request by uh, next Monday, which is the 8th, May 8th, that would be great. Tom Fody. I think if we're going to do public hearings and the comments have no effect on what we're going to do, we have to make that clear in the beginning before they show up to the thing. I mean, they were so mad about the scub thing showing up to public hearings at the Marine Fisheries Council. I don't think that they're not going to vote for anything like that. So we really 
need to be careful. This is not, this is just an information meeting only and answer questions on that because if you tell people, they're gonna expect that you're gonna do action for what they testify to. So I'm, I'm basically, let's make it clear what you're doing. I'm surprised because I didn't know that. I mean, sitting, and I've been sitting here for 35 years. Th thanks, Tom. Are there, are there any other questions for Emily? All right, let's go ahead and go into item number six on our agenda. Consider approval of addendum one on ocean commercial quota transfers. As a reminder, at the January board meeting, the board postponed final action on this addendum until today. We already heard the technical committee report on quota utilization projections, and Emily will now review the options in draft addendum one and brief summary of the public comments and the advisory panel report. After a presentation, we can take questions before the board considers final action. So Emily, off to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so as, as Mr. Chair mentioned, I will today review the statement of the problem, uh, the timeline and the proposed management options. I'll also give an overview of the public comment and advisory panel report that was received. Um, and I'll also just do a brief recap of the technical committee report um, that was presented by our stock assessment subcommittee chair a couple hours ago now. Um, again, the board action for consideration today is selecting a management option and considering final approval of addendum one. So starting with the statement of the problem, again, there have been several questions and concerns raised about the striped bass commercial quota system with particular concern about the use of 1970s as a reference period. Um, and the board decided not to address these commercial quota uh, system concerns as part of Amendment 7. There was some support for addressing this issue in a separate management action. So that brought us to uh, this draft addendum. In August 2021, the board initiated this draft addendum to consider allowing for the voluntary transfer of striped bass commercial quota in the ocean region. And so this action was considered as an option to provide some more immediate relief to states that were seeking a change to their commercial quota. Um, and again, as a note, there are several other commission managed species that do allow for the voluntary transfer of commercial quota between states. So here's the timeline of the draft addendum. Um, the plan development team developed an initial draft for consideration back in October of uh, 2021. At that point, the board postponed consideration of the draft addendum until May of 2022, and then again until August of 2022. Um, and then in November 2022, the board approved this draft addendum for public comment. We went out for public comment uh, between November 2022 and January 2023. Um, and then at the January board meeting just a couple months ago, the board postponed final action on this addendum until this meeting today and also tasked the TC with doing some projections uh, for quota utilization scenarios. So here we are today. The board is again considering um, selecting measures and final approval of this addendum. So I'll get into the proposed management options at this point. So the proposed management options here consider allowing for the voluntary transfer of striped bass commercial quota in the ocean region between states that have ocean quota. So again, these options do not address the Chesapeake Bay commercial quota and they do not consider transfers between the Chesapeake Bay and the ocean region or vice versa. Um, and also note that any commercial quota that has been reallocated to a state's recreational fishery, for example, New Jersey's quota that's currently reallocated to their rec bonus program is not eligible for commercial quota transfers. And then if transfers are permitted, uh, quota would be transferred pound for pound between the states. So there would be some uncertainty associated with transfers between states that harvest different sized striped bass. Um, we know states catch different sized fish due to several factors. Um, and we also know that through conservation equivalency over time, states have adjusted their commercial size limits. And this has resulted to changes in some, some quotas over time. So 
a pound of striped bass quota is not equal across all states. And some of the proposed options do incorporate a provision to try to address this discrepancy. So moving into the specific options here, option A is the status quo in which commercial quota transfers are not permitted. So then the alternative options would allow voluntary transfers. And those options range from option B, which would be the least restrictive option to allow transfers down through option E, which would be the most restrictive option to allow transfers. So again, this range of options would allow transfers with certain conditions based on stock status and also based on the discretion of the board. So starting with the alternative option B, this would be the general transfer provision. So for this option, voluntary transfers would be permitted with no restrictions, but there would be a conservation tax if the stock is overfished. So there's no limit on how much quota could be transferred, but if transfers occur when the stock is overfished, a 5% conservation tax would apply to address that issue that a pound of quota is not equal across all states. So for example, if you have a state that transfers 10,000 pounds to another state, the receiving state would receive 9,500 pounds, and that remaining 500 pounds would be that conservation tax, and that would no longer be available for harvest that year. So moving on to option C, option C would limit commercial quota transfers based on stock status. So voluntary transfers would be permitted, but no transfers would be allowed at all when the stock is overfished. So again, this is similar to the previous option. There's no limit on how much quota can be transferred, but for this option, no, transfer, no transfers could occur at all when the stock is overfished. Um, it is important to note that because the stock is currently overfished, this option would not provide near-term relief to states that are currently seeking additional quota. So moving on to option D, option D is the board discretion option. So for this option, the board would decide whether voluntary transfers are permitted and the board could set criteria on those transfers. So the board each year or, or every two years would decide by their final meeting whether or not to allow transfers for the next one or two years and could take into account information on stock status uh, and on fisheries performance. And then if the board does decide to allow transfers when the stock is overfished, that same type of conservation tax would apply to those transfers. So the other aspect of option D is that the board may set certain criteria for transfers. So the board could set a limit on how much total quota could be transferred in a given year. The board could set a seasonal limitation on transfers. So for example, the board could say, you know, only X percent of the allowable quota amount that year could be transferred during the first half of the year. And the board could also determine a state's eligibility to receive a transfer. So for example, the board could say that a state couldn't request a transfer until they've landed X percent of their quota. Um, and then finally, for this option D, as far as timeline, you know, if the board does select um, option D and approves the addendum this year, the board could decide um, today whether or not to allow transfers for this current fishing year, 2023. And then we'd start this regular process of by the last meeting of the year discussing transfers for the following year. And then finally, the last option is option E. So this would be the most restrictive option. So this would limit transfers based on both stock status and board discretion. So again, the board discretion, the board would decide whether or not to allow transfers. The board could set criteria for the next one to two years, except no transfers could occur at all if the stock is overfished. So you have both the board discretion but you also have this provision that would not allow any transfers when the stock is overfished. 
So just a couple of general process notes, you know, if transfers are permitted with these alternatives B through E, there's the general voluntary transfer process. You know, transfers require a donor state and a receiving state, and they can occur at any time during the year at the agreement of those two states. Uh, transfers may occur up to 45 days after the last day of the calendar year. Uh, the board may specify any number from zero to 45 days around that provision. Uh, the administrative commissioner of the states would submit a signed letter to the commission and a transfer would be final when those states receive written confirmation from commission staff. And quota transfers do not permanently impact a state's quota share. And then once a state receives a transfer, that state is responsible for any overage of that uh, quota they have received. Um, and as far as the compliance schedule for this addendum, any measures approved by the board would be effective immediately on the date of approval. Um, and if transfers are per permitted, states would have to account for any of that extra quota when they're determining how many commercial tags they would need for the year. Um, and just a note here that if the board does select option A, which is status quo, no transfers, there would that would mean that there's no change to current management. So there would be no final addendum one document posted. Um, in this scenario, we would add some information in the FMP review, acknowledging and summarizing that this process took place. So I will now move into the public comment summary. And again, we collected comments between November and January. Uh, we held several public hearings um, and got a couple thousand comments. So here's the comment count table. Um, the vast majority of comments favored the status quo, option A, no transfers permitted. And then of those who favored any of the alternatives, option B through E, option B had the most support. So for the majority of those comments favoring option A status quo, the most common rationale provided by the commenters was concern about expanding harvest and increasing fishing mortality while the stock is still rebuilding, um, overfished and experiencing poor recruitment. Uh, comments noted that management should focus on stock rebuilding um, and referred to the board's past decisions to not allow quota transfers. Um, and some comments noted that these transfers would be in conflict with uh, stakeholder input during the Amendment 7 process. Um, and some comments noted that if states aren't harvesting their full quotas, they should not be able to transfer that quota to other parts of the coast. Of those who supported option B, uh, this would be the least restrictive option. Uh, many commenters noted that they were commercial fishermen and they noted that quota transfers allow for the efficient use of commercial quota and that the commercial fishery has a relatively small impact uh, on the overall fishery as compared to the recreational sector. Uh, they also noted that the commercial fishery already has accountability measures in place with payback uh, for any quota overages. So those in favor of option D, that would be the board discretion option noted that some board discretion would be beneficial, but cautioned against overly restrictive criteria uh, for any transfers. And then those in favor of option E, which would be that most restrictive option to allow transfers, noted that this would provide maximum oversight by the board, but would still provide some benefit to states that were seeking transfers. So I'll now provide the advisory panel report. The AP met in January um, and the AP chair asked that I provide the report um, instead. Uh, so a majority of AP members, similar to the public, supported option A, um, again, citing the public comments in support of option A and noted that transfers aren't appropriate when the stock is overfished. Um, and the also noted that transfers would not benefit the striped bass stock in any way and also noted some concern about behind the scenes horse trading and discussions in terms of uh, quota transfers. There was also concern about transferring striped bass from states that harvest smaller fish to states that harvested larger fish. 
And then as far as um, there were four AP members who supported option B, again, noting that quotas were originally developed um, by the science and the commercial fishery is already constrained with those accountability measures. And again, the fishery is primarily recreational. So the commercial fishery has a relatively small impact. Um, some AP members had some additional recommendations. Uh, first, if the board does allow transfers, there was a recommendation that the board eliminate that 45-day provision, which allows transfers to occur after the year ends. Um, a couple other AP members recommended that transfers be permitted only for states that have active commercial fisheries. Um, and if the board doesn't allow transfers at this time, the AP was split on whether or not to consider transfers in the future. Some supported considering it again if the stock, once the stock is recovered, others didn't support considering transfers at all in the future again. Um, and then a couple AP members had some recommendations about taking a look at the quota system more holistically um, and potentially updating the, the reference data for that. Um, and so before I wrap up, I just want to give a brief reminder of the technical committee report we heard a couple of hours ago. Um, so the board again tasked the TC with running um, specific projections for quota utilization scenarios. And I'll just pull up here the um, on the next slide, the TC's final conclusions and discussion on this issue. The TC noted that the impact of additional quota utilization on fishing mortality and rebuilding is negligible. Um, and the projected scenarios were sort of the, the worst case scenarios. And that small change that we saw was largely due to population dynamics um, between 2022 and 2023. And really the scale of the commercial fishery removals uh, is very small compared to the overall removals. So with that, I am happy to take questions. Thank you, Emily, for your presentation. We'll go to the board for questions for Emily. John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And as I mentioned earlier, I, I just wanted to clarify that on those projections, we're talking about pretty much the worst of the worst case scenarios because they operated with a uh, estimated fishing mortality that used, first of all, used 2019 before uh, Addendum 6 went into effect. And then to estimate the fishing mortality for 2023, um, I know Mike Celestino said it would be a small change in the F, but uh, was that quantified as to how much of a change it was to the F? I mean, it, was it over 5%? So, uh, Manal, I can go to the previous slide. Um, so for the scenario, the quota utilization scenarios, that projected F was that worst case scenario, and it was only about 2% higher than the scenario without the additional quota. Was that your question? Okay, so you're saying that with, with the, well, I meant just using these into 2023, adding that in, um, you know, it's no longer a constant F, right? It was more of a constant catch formula. So it, it increased the, the estimated F. And then as you carry that out till 2029, of course, that w accumulated, did it not? And even with that, it was still a very negligible change. Just wanted to clarify. Exactly. So there were a different slightly different set of assumptions used for those quota utilization projections. And so those different assumptions, the TC noted that it was those different assumptions that largely led to that small increase that we saw. Thanks, John. Any other questions for Emily? Jason? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a really, it just kind of popped into my head as you were going through and, and thank you. Um, Emily, for the um, the review and the the information on the the options. Um, so a, a couple times during the presentation, there's a statement about you know a pound is not a 
uh, pound, you know, they're not equal. Um, and like, I, th I think I know what that means, but I just wanted to check. I, I mean, is it a, um, you know, if you're talking about nine pounds, it could be three, three pound fish or one nine pound fish and the spawning potential is sort of different between those two scenarios. Is that what that means? Exactly, right. So with states harvesting different sized striped bass, you know, a pound of or, you know, 100 pounds of quota is a you know much different number of fish in some states than others, depending on the size of the striped bass and all that comes along with it, like spawning potential. Thanks, Jason. Other questions for Emily? Seeing none, we'll turn to board discussion, and I would encourage uh, board members whenever they have the opportunity to make a motion. And John Clark, you start. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'd like to uh, amend the motion that the the postponed motion, and I would like to amend it to change it from option D to option E. And if I can get a second, I will speak to that. Thanks, John. Is there a second to John's motion? Justin? Go ahead, John. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, clearly, we heard, we've heard through this whole process about all the concern about this. And with that, um, it is a very small amount of change and removals we're talking about here. Going, changing from option D to option E introduces two safeguards for the stock. First of all, there won't be any transfers if the stock status is overfished. And then the board has full discretion over transfers uh, beyond that. So I'd say that, you know, we have it um, very well covered there that the board would have to be comfortable with any transfers before they could go forward. Um, once again, the reason that Delaware has been pushing this, and I think some of the other states are also interested, is in our case, it's a fairness issue based on these very outdated uh, quota uh, set up where it's going back to the 1970s, which, you know, fades further and further into the past. Um, we knew that to go back and, or at this point, to do a full reallocation amendment would probably be a very, very lengthy process. So we figured this would get some relief sooner. And I just wanted to put in perspective that uh, with the scale of our fishery, even if we were to bring ourselves back to where the quota was before addendum four, uh, we'd only be looking at about another 3,900 3, to 4,000 striped bass, which is uh, based on 2020 route two removals, that's uh, well less than 1% of total removal. So, you know, as I said, between the fact that we have all the safeguards in place with this option and the scale of the requests from certain states such as ours and the board's discretion over granting any transfers, I think this is something that the, uh, I hope the, the board can approve because I think it, will help um, some of these small scale fisheries and it will not harm the stock. Thank you. Thanks, John. Justin, would you like to comment as a seconder? Marty, before uh, Justin comments, um, there actually wasn't a postponed motion that you had made, John. Oh. So John, could you just read this motion and, and sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. So in other words, the motion I had made was substituted, right? So, okay. Sorry, man, it's hard to keep. And we just had that whole course on Robert's Rules of Orders. Messing up already. Okay, uh, move to approve option E, board discretion of commercial quota transfer provision, except no transfers of stock is overfished. All right, and Justin, you're willing to second it. Okay. All right, so we finished with a comment. We've corrected the motion. And Justin, you'd like to come. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, I think this is a reasonable option. It's very conservative. We had some projections we saw earlier today that show this adds a very small amount of removals and is not going to put rebuilding at risk. Um, certainly Connecticut's sensitive to the fact 
uh, you know, we were recently challenged by quota allocations for some of our species, and we took action around this table to correct that. I think whenever any one of our members around the table is sort of feeling like they're disadvantaged by their quota, we should try to take action, reasonable action to adjust quota allocations. Um, I, I just think it's it's time to dispense with this this management action. It's been hanging for a while. We started addendum two this morning. We should wrap up addendum one uh, before we get going on addendum two. And you know, I think there's a lot of controls in place with this. The board's going to have discretion to allow quota transfers to happen or not. Um, you know, my, certainly my intent or what I see as the intent of this is to essentially provide some more commercial quota to Delaware. Uh, if this program starts to grow beyond that, I think the board's got to consider whether they want to reauthorize this program in subsequent years. Um, but I just think this is a really reasonable, conservative option, and I would hope the rest of the board sees it that way, too. Thanks. Thanks, Justin. And um, I might turn to staff. I just got a message that Doug Grout is not here, but he has a proxy. Um, I, might, do I have it wrong? Renee is. Okay. Thank you. Just want to be sure. R Richie is. Richie White is Doug's proxy. Sorry. All right, Jason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to um, first thank the technical committee. Um, we had asked for that extra work to be done, um, and uh, you know the point of doing the extra work was to just. Um, really verify, um, you know, this this notion that allowing the transfers might have significant impacts um, to a whole host of of things in in the um, in the population. And, and I think what we've seen, at least from the work that they've done, is you know this is a small proportion of a small proportion, um, and and so you know the the impacts of allowing this on the population are are very small. Um, just to speak for a minute about this, maybe seems a little incongruent uh, for folks, given what we just did before lunch. Um, but and I'm not ignoring, you know, a lot of the public comment that ended up in my inbox and in in the meeting materials, supported status quo. But a lot of the reasoning behind that. <clears throat> The status quo meaning no transfers. A lot of the reasoning behind that was fear about rebuilding and um, the, the current state of the population, which you know I think those are well founded. Um, but this option in the motion that's up before us, there would be no transfers now. While um, you know the the stock is not um, doing well, um, both because there's board discretion to not allow it and uh, stock status. Um, that wouldn't allow it. So, you know, the um, for me that kind of um, assuages those fears, and I think we could put this infrastructure in place. We'll, you know, work hard to get the stock back into good shape, and then we have this mechanism uh, in place for allowing some flexibility within the commercial fishery. So, I, I think it's a good idea. It's nothing that's going to happen immediately. Uh, but it's something we can put into place um, that could have benefit um, for the very small commercial component in the future. So um, I support the motion. Thank you, Jason. Megan Ware? Thank you. And uh, I appreciate Delaware putting up a motion that's considering uh, stock status in terms of when uh, quota transfers may be permitted. I wanted to think about this a few years out and be uh, honest about what I think my reaction may be. Um, so I'm thinking in the 2024 stock assessment, I'm hopeful we will have a result that says we are no longer overfished. That's at least what the projections indicate we may get. Um, but I'm also expecting that assessment to tell us we need more work to hit rebuilding by 2029. So I think we could have a situation where we are asking the fishery for more reductions in F and at the same time considering quota transfers. And I'm personally going to struggle in that situation with approving quota transfers because I think um, it's kind of doing two different types of actions at the same time or two different outcomes at the same time. So I'm not sure how I'm going to vote on this, but I just wanted to be upfront 
particularly to the Delaware stakeholders about um, what my thoughts on this may be while we're rebuilding the stock. So thank you. Thank you, Megan. We'll go to Chris Bat Savage and then Max Appleman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, while I appreciate the, the, the safeguards and limited scope of uh, transfers that could occur under option E, uh, I, I cannot support it uh, at this time and just quickly explain why. Um, you know, although the stakeholder input for North Carolina was largely opposed to transfers, uh, the commercial industry in North Carolina generally supported the concepts of, of transfers. And uh, so my opposition isn't from reluctance to transfer quota. We do that with, with other species. Um, if uh, if we found through the, 20, the projections through 2022 that, that F was uh, still in that range where it was in 2020 and 2021, we had a high chance of uh, rebuilding the stock by 2029, I could probably uh, support uh, the, this, this motion. Um, but even with the uh, actions that we took uh, earlier today to address uh, stock rebuilding, uh, I think uh, I think it's still going to be a major challenge over the next several years to actually um, constrain F enough. So even though the uh, the increase in catch would be very small compared to the overall catch, I think we should really focus on whatever we can do to uh, uh, keep F low enough to uh, rebuild the stock, especially. Uh, when we consider the uh, the low recruitment that we're currently seeing in the population. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. We have Max Appleman and then Tom Fody. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to abstain on this motion for state-to-state uh, -state transfers uh, today, but I wanted to just comment for a minute on um, commercial quota transfers as a, a general policy. Uh, we support quota transfers to address a number of different uh, challenges and issues that can arise with quota management, especially with uh, what might come down the pike with climate change and shifting stocks and providing that flexibility. Um, we supported developing this addendum um, through the public process. Um, but we also recognize that this is a somewhat unique situation considering the actions that we just took to reduce F. And so we're going to abstain uh, today. Thank you, Max. Tom Fody. It looks like we're going to wind up with a three inch size limit, a three inch opportunity to catch fish recreationally in New Jersey if we get this in, in place by the 180 days. Under that veil and under all the things that went on this, this morning, I can't vote for this. I had had no support for it in any of the people I heard from in New Jersey, and it's just a, a difficult situation. What I would support, and what I've said for the last, I don't know, 10 years since we got, actually longer, about 15 or 20 years since we no longer are considered producing areas in the Delaware River and the Delaware, uh, I mean, in the Hudson River, that we revisit this issue because the Chesapeake Bay seems to have more problems than the Delaware River does in the Hudson River. And I, from what I've been told that some of the tag studies over the years have said that 40% of the coastal migratory stock that is coming out of the Delaware River and the Hudson River now in certain years. So we should be looking at the role of those contribution into the whole system and should allow us to do what Maryland, Virginia, Tomac River can do in the Chesapeake Bay and look at it would Delaware be able to do some things differently than when we do? It's not going to change in New Jersey because we, we, we're pretty much set with our regulations. And the same thing in New York and the harbor. I mean, New York was really shut down because of PCBs commercially anyway in, in the Hudson River. And so that's why I can't support this motion at this time. I don't know what New Jersey will vote, but I you know I can't support it. Thank you, Tom. Next in the queue is Eric Reed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I do appreciate the fact that Delaware put up option E with all the sideboards on it. Um, just to remind everybody that it is highly unlikely that a limited access fishery like the commercial fishery will exceed its allotted quota in any given year by, let's say, 40%. It's highly, highly unlikely. Commercial fishery is well regulated. We carry observers. We get a lot of data from that fishery. And 
the notion that we would not adopt the ability to consider having that particular segment of the industry catch their 100, 100% of their allocated quota is mind numbing to me why we wouldn't do it. So being mind numb, Mr. Chairman, that's all I have to say at the moment. Thank you. All right, thank you, Eric. Uh, Renee Zobel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wasn't going to ask this question unless this was proposed in interest of time, um, but this was a clarifying question that Doug Grout had, and I thought it was a good one. Um, so when can the board consider their discretion to do this? Is it after a stock assessment specifically has a status of over, you know, no longer being in that stock status, or is it projections? So say this stock assessment comes out and says the stock is no longer overfished, but projects in a subsequent year that that will no longer be, or says it is overfished, but projects in a subsequent year it will no longer be overfished. Can the board consider it based on the projection? Thanks. Thanks for that question. Uh, it would be the results of a stock assessment. So the stock status would have to change to not overfished. Mike. Just a clarifying question, then a comment. I, I, I think this is true. The board will have discretion to not do transfers, even if we're not overfish, correct? Um, so we can, you know, I hate to go against all the public opinion, but I think there's enough restrictions on E that it, in many times it's going to approach A. And I can see scenarios where we are not overfishing, but we're heading to an overfish condition and I would vote not to do transfers. So I think there's enough safeguards um, on this one. So we can support it. Thank you, Mike. Before we uh, ask for any final comments in this discussion, um, I just want to remind everyone, we this has already gone out to public comments. So I wasn't planning on taking any at this time. Um, so I will ask um, if there's any final comments or any any additional discussion by the board members before we put this to a vote. Jason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, <clears throat> so I'm not going to make a comment now. If this were to pass, I would like to make a comment. So I just wanted to get that in front of you. Um, thank you. All right, final call. Any last words from anyone before we take the vote? Uh, let's do a one minute caucus. One minute. Okay, board members, let's get ready to call the question. Everyone in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Potomac River Fisheries Commission, Rhode Island. Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, uh, Virginia, District of Columbia, Maryland, Delaware. All those opposed, raise your hands. New Hampshire. Any null votes? Maine, North Carolina, Pennsylvania. Any abstentions? Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA Fisheries. The motion passes 10 to 1 to 3 to 2. And do we need to read the read the motion in? And Jason, to, to your comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a, a comment. So as has been mentioned, we do quota um, transfers and other species. I think, um, you know, back in the day, uh, it was, you know, everybody was sort of racing to get out uh, first for things like bluefish. I'll, I'll use as an example. Um, it wasn't very collegial. It was um, kind of competitive. Um, I think we've developed a nice rapport amongst uh, the states that participate in trying to get transfers. 
Um, and so I know folks have been focused on Delaware as the um, kind of keystone uh, transfer state, but Rhode Island would also um, potentially be interested in transfers. And so I hope that we can uh, develop a same sort of process where we sort of consult ahead of time and, and make our requests in a collegial way. Thank you, Jason. Well put. So that takes care of item number six or five. Oh, okay. So we need a motion to approve the addendum. John Clark, do we have a second? Ray Kane. John, could you read it into the record? One, one sec, one sec. <laughs> Even the microphone's against me. Okay, move to approve addendum one as modified today with an implementation date effective today. Any discussion on the motion? None. Any objections to the motion? Seeing none, it passes. Unanim unanimously. Oh, it's a long meeting. Okay, so that takes care of item number six. And we're doing item number seven, other business. Is there any other business to bring before this board? Tom. I brought up before what I was talking about is the contribution of the Hudson River and the Delaware River to the uh, overall coastal migratory stocks. I've been asking this question for about 15 years and still haven't gotten an answer. I know the technical committee has looked at it a couple of times and didn't have the necessary information to pull it out. But some of the tagging studies that I've seen over the years prove that we're a lot bigger than we were with the 15 or 25 percent that when we started this, and it's a bigger percentage of the fisheries right now. And I would look also want the technical committee to look at what would be needed for Delaware River to be considered again what it rightly should be, the spawning area, and the same thing with the Hudson River. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. This is Emily. I'll just respond. I'll say I think maybe during the next benchmark assessment, the TC will probably look at, um, you know, any new studies on the contribution of each spawning area to the stock and provide any updated information um, on that. All right. Thanks, Tom, for that question. Any other new business to bring before the commission? Tony. Tony. Not new business, but just to set up some expectations for the addendum that was approved earlier. As Bob said, we didn't really talk about timing. Um, it's our intention to bring a draft document to the board in August. And depending on if the board makes any changes to that document or not, and whether or not we feel we can actually get the document out, comment and summarized in time for the annual meeting, or we may need to hold a special meeting of the board probably early in in November to uh, finalize that document um, in order to have states implement those measures for 2024. Um, so I just wanted to put that on folks radar now um, and then Emily will reach out um, probably either today or tomorrow looking for nominations for a, a plan development team. All right thank you Tony. Any other new business? Any other business? Seeing none, I'd seek a motion to adjourn. Dave Sikorsky, seconded by Ray Kane. We are adjourned, folks.